Fresh from Morrowind, the life taker of the Kimona Tong is a highly skilled murderer thief who specializes in instantly disabling or killing opponents whilst using tools and tricks not seen in Skyrim before. Tested on legendary difficulty with Revenge of the Enemies, so your experience may differ. Stay tuned after the character story for the mod loadout and character setup instructions. The Life Taker begins the game with a full set of chitin armor. He wields a dagger in his right hand and either a katar or a claw in his left hand. Going back to his bandit roots, his first power is known as Knockout. Any unsuspecting target is easy prey as he clubs them on the back of the head with his bare fists, after which he can rob the unconscious victim with relative ease. Not in stealth, the use key will push the unconscious body around. This is useful for hiding the victim. If anyone the game considers friendly with the unconscious target witnesses the unconscious body, they will enter what is called an alert state. If they see you near the unconscious body, they will report it as an assault. For a limited period of time after the target has woken up, they will also be in an alert state, and if they see you, they will consider you an enemy, report you for the assault and attack. That said, Knockout is a great tool when you don't want to kill the target and you know you're not going to be around right after they wake up. Now, if you have a dagger equipped while you sneak up behind the target and use them with the use key, you will instead <laughs> slit their throat. This will instantly kill any target that is of a playable race. There are of course exceptions such as Mirak. Other races such as animals, dragons, Draugr, Falmer, can't be killed in this way. Now the chance for success is extremely high, however there's an unseen formula and random chance coupled with the uh, enemy being higher level and wearing heavy armor can actually make this skill fail. In spite of that, whether it's a conjurer, or a forsworn, a town guard, or just somebody you don't like, this is the most efficient way to kill them. And while it may be tempting to knock them out and then kill them, Knocked out targets are immune to damage for game balance reasons. You'll have to wait for them to wake up to assassinate them properly. Right off the bat, you're going to know how to craft special arrows, such as noisemaker arrows that will distract enemies. When combat begins, two ancestor ghosts will be summoned to your side to protect you provided you kept up your end of the bargain, allowing you to get the job done. Now when I say kept up your end of the bargain, your character is what other people would consider insane. Whispers telling you to kill a specific target and you will see an overlay over that target, a kind of glowing effect. When you kill that target, you will receive 10 Ashborn charges. And consequently, these charges are used automatically when you enter combat to summon the spirits that defend you. After you've obeyed the whispers in your head five times, you'll be granted the Balefire ability which will allow you to instantly kill targets below 30% health. The playstyle mostly consists of you hitting enemies from behind, trying to kill them instantly, and whittling their health down slowly when you can. When you get enemies below 25% health, you will automatically do quadruple damage, allowing you to finish them off. This build, by design, includes no block or parry mods for your dual wielding. If you're not a warrior, don't confuse yourself with one. Assassinate, divert attention, and run. In this, rope arrows are perhaps the most invaluable tool you have because you can climb anywhere. Coming from the Kamona Tong, he shares their moral code. They are involved in drugs, slavery, prostitution, extortion, in addition to theft and murder. And the Life Taker will use anything and everything to advance his position in the world. Among the Kamona Tong, he held the rank of Life Taker, which is an elite position that places him above and beyond the countless thugs and brutes. This makes him prideful in all things. If someone goes and insults him, he will not take it lightly. He may or may not kill them on the spot, but he will not forget. In his past missions for the Tong, there were situations where no amount of brute force could overcome a target's defenses, rendering the thugs useless. The Life Taker, on the other hand, slips in unnoticed and executes the target with reckless abandon. 
then flees before reinforcements can arrive. However, the days of him doing Tong missions are well past. With the destruction of House Halahu, the Tong has officially disbanded. In reality, the elite members have scattered to the Four Winds in order to consolidate wealth and power for the day they might reunite. The Life Taker really only knows of one way to do that. For example, should he fail a pickpocketing chance, but still feels he would be capable of coming out of the ordeal unscathed, he would gladly kill the target for the same loot. The lives and happiness of others mean nothing to him. He constantly asks himself whenever starting a new quest or mission, how does this benefit me? And that is the criteria he uses in order to advance. He would see no reason to do tasks that do not benefit him and he would betray a fellow adventurer in a heartbeat. If someone insulted him in the past, he would plan out his revenge, be it stealing all their worldly goods, killing their spouse, or killing them outright. He would think twice about killing a fellow Dark Elf, but other than that, the Tomona Tong take pleasure in killing Outlanders. One of the first things the Tong looked for in the past when it was recruiting was a disdain for all Outlanders something that it cultivated in its existing members. This disdain, the Life Taker has in abundance. If he helps a Nord, or anyone who's not a Dark Elf, it would be due to his benefit, and he would be very likely to betray them afterward. It's this mentality that allows him to excel as a thief, a murderer, and an overall criminal. It is his greed, his selfishness, the entire mentality that drove him to be a worshipper of the House of Troubles. Almost as bad as his disdain for all non-Dark Elves is his hatred for the Divines and the anticipations that the other Dark Elves worship. So it's very unlikely he would do any tasks for the Anticipations or the Divine Priest. He blames the gods for having allowed the destruction of Northeast Marwind, the place he called home. If he came to Azura's shrine, he would likely blacken her star in order to get revenge upon her. With pretty much all the factions and guilds, he would see a personal issue with a Nord telling him what to do, but if the money was right, if he was hurting for money, he would bite the bullet, but he probably wouldn't conform to all the rules of every guild. For example, if he joins the Companions, he will ultimately regret his decision because it's a bunch of Nord nonsense, their honor and glory, and he will realize that he's thrown away his purity to become some mongrel beast. So, at the conclusion of the companion questline, it goes without saying he would cure himself of the lycanthropy. Admittedly, the College of Winterhold really wouldn't be a consideration because he doesn't have any aptitude in the way of magic. In fact, he's downright horrible at all of it except illusion. And he can wander and have all manner of adventures. However, things won't really fall into place for him until he joins the Dark Brotherhood when he realizes that he was the listener all along, and that is why he hears the whispers of death. Only when he's restored the Dark Brotherhood to its full glory will he understand and fulfill his destiny. If he decides to join the conflict between the Dawn Guard and the Vampires, he would ultimately side with the Vampires, because Molag Ball, the originator of the Vampires, is one of the four corners of the House of Troubles that he worships. As for Skyrim Civil War, he can only make one choice. Hold it there, Elf. This is Stormcloak territory. You done make feel are all alike. Skyrim has no use for your kind. You got some bad luck coming, Stormcloaks. You done make feel Marwind, land of the Dunmer, also known as Dark Elves. Marwind consists of a large chunk of Tamriel as well as the island of Vardenfell. The land was ruled by several great houses. When Tiber Septim's empire first arrived, House Halahu's territory was on the border of the empire. They were not a warrior house, so they accepted the empire with open arms. As a result, the Imperials held House Halahu in much higher regard than the other houses that opposed Imperial rule. This put them in the perfect position to grab power when Vivek signed the treaty with Tiber Septim that gave Marwind both a position in the Empire, yet full autonomy. In spite of this autonomy, House Hulahu welcomed Imperial Law, the Imperial Legion, and the freedom of trade and religion which was banned by Dunmer culture. This led many to believe that House Hulahu was actually a pawn of the Empire. They couldn't be further from the truth. Their culture originally worshipped 
what were known as the Anticipations, Azura, Boethia, and Mephala. The concepts of Aedra or Divines being good and Daedra being bad didn't exist in their culture. When Mundus, the material plane was created by Lorcan, the Divines who decided to stay were named Aedra, our ancestors in High Elf, and the ones who didn't stay, who left the sphere of Mundus before it was created, were known as Daedra, not our ancestors. They exist in the eternal void known as Oblivion. The eternal spirits who became Aedra gave up a significant portion of their powers in order to do this. This is where their culture spirals off from the High Elf culture that worshipped the Aedra. So when it comes right down to it, Daedra are more powerful than Aedra and that is why they are worshipped, or were worshipped before the coming of the living gods. Amalexia, the healing mother and the lady of mercy. Sotha Sil, god king of artificers and wizards. And Vivek, the warrior poet. They would be known as the tribunal. It was at this point that Daedra worship became illegal as Marwind had three living gods. Out of all the great houses, House Halau has always had the greatest foresight and when they saw which way the winds were blowing, when Vivek allowed the Empire in, that was the time to cease all resistance and instead take advantage of what the Empire had to offer. And it was thanks to that foresight and political manipulation that when the Empire went to Marwind and declared that there needed to be a single representative, a figurehead for the people, it was the leader of House Olau, their actual Chancellor, who was declared the king of all Morrowind. In the most technical terms, House Olahu was not actually granted control of Morrowind. Rather, their chancellor was broken off from the house and made his own independent monarchy. Now, Amalexia, I mean Amalexia, didn't really want to renounce any political power, but her divine powers granted her a vision of doom if she didn't cooperate with the Tiber Septum Empire. The seat of power for House Halahu, Mornhold, became the imperial capital of Morrowind. And while Vivek remained behind to make his city the spiritual capital of Vardenfell, Amalexia traveled to Mornhold and established the Temple of the Tribunal there so that she could be close to the king in case he tried something. Eventually, a rebellion claims the life of the king of Morrowind, but his wife is able to flee with his two children back to Sentinel where she was born. Not long afterward, the hero of Daggerfall actually visits the capital city of Sentinel. The hero not only meets with and does a quest for the former queen of Morrowind, but also for the future king of Morrowind. You see, his mother was a former member of the Thieves' Guild, and he knew quite a bit about poison. Read the book, A Game at Dinner. The next Chancellor of the House Olahu had taken over his father's throne. Well, they believe it was poison, because the young prince is now the king of Morrowind. So this raises the question, how has the House Olahu managed to maintain its power so well. It isn't just political foresight, it is the ability to make things happen. Enter the Kimona Tong. Absolutely not to be confused with the Morag Tong, which was a legitimate assassination organization sanctioned by the government. Thugs, bandits, skooma dealers, smugglers, all united under a single criminal organization, the Kimona Tong. What makes them different from any other Dunmer supremacist organization is that they're willing to do absolutely anything to keep and get more power. Low-ranking agents in their corner clubs get information for the Tong. Their nearly endless income came from the skooma trade as well as their secret smuggling routes. The Thieves' Guild was tame compared to the illegal activities they would commit. The reality is that no one in Morrowind could touch them. It was a symbiotic relationship between House Olahu and the Kimona Tong that allowed the Kimona Tong to avoid any legal repercussions for what they did. And at the same time, the House Olahu got things done that could not have normally gotten done under the law. These ideal times, however, would not last forever. During one of Marwin's biggest crises, the spreading of the blight and the corpus disease, they discovered that the sixth great house 
that was thought to have been destroyed, the House of Dagoth, was responsible for it. And it was discovered that the kingpin of the Kimona Tong was actually a collaborator. When the hero of Marwind, the Nevin Nereen, slew the kingpin and took his rightful place as Chancellor of House Halahu, it appeared as if things were finally getting back on track. However, something unexpected happened. Dagoth Ur welcomes you, Nerevar, my old friend. But to this place where destiny is made, why have you come unprepared? It will all be decided here. I believe I will prevail, but I cannot be sure. The Nevin Nereen defeated Dagoth Ur not once, but twice, unbinding the heart of Lorcan from the mortal world forever. He was a god, and now he's dead. If one can truly kill the god, the blight is gone and we have survived. Now we must dedicate ourselves to rebuilding the temple. We have lost our divine powers, but not altogether. Some token of the people's faith remains. Our Malexia, Sothasil and I gained our divine powers from the heart of Lord Khan. And now we no longer have access to the heart, so we must lose our divinity. Our days as gods are numbered. I have told my priests that I shall withdraw from the world, and that the temple should be prepared for a change. We may be honored no longer as gods, but as saints and heroes. And the temple will return to the faith of our forefathers, the worship of our ancestors, and the three good Daedra, Azura, Mephala, and Butia. The missions and traditions of the temple must continue, but without its living gods. That's when Amalexia, I mean Amalexia, lost her freaking mind. The maze band has allowed me to travel to this place. Here, I smooth so the sill. Here, I summon the fabricants to attack Mornhold. Here it ends. This clockwork city is to be your death. I will tell the tale myself when this is done. I will tell my people how with your dying breath you proclaim your devotion to me, the one true God. Your death will end this prophecy and unite my people again under one God, one faith, one rule by my divine law. The puppet king will lay down his arms and bow to my will. Those who do not yield will be destroyed. Lord Nerevar's former lover died at the hands of his reincarnation, the hero of Marwind. Vivek was now the last of Marwind's living gods, and he was ready to have the temple stop worshipping him as one. It's said that sometime before the Oblivion Crisis, Vivek disappeared. In the officially unofficial product known as the Trial of Vivek, Vivek is placed on trial for his crimes against Lord Nerevar and all of Morrowind. Azura is summoned as a witness. Vivek reveals that he has reached an ascendant state beyond life, death, good, and evil, known as Chim. Using Azura's own star that has been unnaturally forced to hold the soul of Amalexia as the catalyst, he binds Azura to the world so that she can't escape, and then he impales her with a divine spear that he conjures out of his armor. Although Daedric Lords can't truly die, Vivek laughs as he got at least some measure of revenge. Vivek takes the satisfaction that he's humiliated Azura with her own artifact as he ascends to Aetherius, leaving the mortal world forever. Even if we were to completely disregard the unofficial Vivek's trial, the fact is, is that Vivek caught the moon, or at least a big asteroid, and he was levitating it with his divine powers. The caverns inside became known as the Ministry of Truth. Sometime after Vivek disappeared, that stone resumed its descent at the original velocity. It impacts the ground with such force it ruptures a magma pocket and bingo bango, red year, Vardenfell's destroyed. Now if we do assume that Vivek's trial is canon, then Azura would be too busy reforming in Oblivion 
in order to have saved Vardenfell. Based on extremely conservative predictions based on the size of the volcano versus the size of the island, 90% of the island would be uninhabitable, with the remaining 10% being barely habitable. And everything surrounding the island, such as large chunks of Marwyn, being completely covered in ash to the point where you can't grow anything. Having been extreme supporters of the tribunal, the House Halahu had already taken a large political hit, and as the Empire failed to help Morrowind because of its own troubles, House Hulahu lost all of its support. Then, the Argonians invaded. The Imperial capital of Morrowind, Mornhold, was sacked by the Argonians. The city was already overrun with refugees from Vardenfell, non-combatants that only got in the way. The Argonians didn't care who they were killing, and it was a wholesale slaughter of Dark Elves. During the invasion, the King of Morrowind successfully flees to the city of Blacklight. Although as the King of Morrowind, he's fine, the House Halahu lost all of their territory to the Argonians. With no territory to call their own, their status as a great house was revoked. All of the higher council members in the house went into hiding as they were assassinated one by one. As for the Kimona Tong, they were so spread out, they were a part of every community and culture. So while the House Halahu fell, the Tong endured. The Tong, however, started to run into difficulties, specifically with the law. As the Empire had all but left Morrowind, and House Redoran was now the dominant house of Morrowind, the Tongs sought to create ties with the House Redoran. As they always did with new businesses, they sent out a wise man to negotiate terms of the business partnership. The wise man's head now adorns a pike outside the Redoran Manor. The Tong officially disbanded. The Kingpin, as well as all of the wise men, were each individually responsible for their own wings of the organization and all of the life takers were sent out to gain wealth and power to bring back to the organization one day years from now. The life taker is a dark elf born in Marwyn, specifically the town of Balmora. The life taker was a common bully growing up. Life on Vardenfell was hard, and in his early life he was caught stealing from the donation box in the local temple. It wasn't actually a member of the temple who caught him, but rather a hooded visitor to the temple. The visitor had him thrown in jail for the night, but he had no intention of staying there. He broke out only to end up face to face with the man. The man offered him a choice, go back to jail or join him. And just like that, he was a member of the Kimona Tong. The Kingpin rules over the Tong. He has a personal life taker known as the Strong Man, who is his personal bodyguard. Also assassinates any wise men who plot against him. For each area of operation the Tong has, a wise man is assigned to oversee the operations. The wise man is a leader unto himself, and he has a personal life taker known as a hammer, who keeps order amongst the lower ranks. The wise man oversees one or two chillers, who are spellblades or battle mages, basically spies from within the mages guild of Morrowind. Finally, each wise man may have any number of life takers who are assassins, usually former members of the Morag Tong, or Dark Brotherhood, sometimes trained from youth within the Tong itself. The Brutes and Thugs aren't even a consideration, they are everywhere, they include spies, smugglers, and thieves. In comparison to a Brute or a Thug, a Life Taker is a top elite. Hooded Man was in fact the Hammer of the Wise Man of the Balmor area, a master of death who secretly worshipped Molog Ball. He trained the Life Taker for two years until the Life Taker was able to instantly assassinate or immobilize opponents. The Life Taker's first solo mission had him taking out a target near a Daedric shrine. When he reached his target, he looked upon the shrine of Molog Ball, and he heard whispers telling him to kill the target now. Obeying the whispers, he felt infused with a strange power, and as he ran from the reinforcements after killing the target, Ancestral Dunmer came to his aid, buying him enough time to escape. The second time this happened was when he was sent to kill a target near the shrine of Merun's Dagon. It was then, and then the next time, the next time, and the next time, he became certain that the House of Troubles was looking after him and not the Reclamations. He was in a very bad location when the eruption first hit. By all accounts, he should have died. 
However, he discovered that he was Ashborn, descended from the Ashlanders. Very resistant to fire, smoke, and ash, he survived. It took him a long time to recover from his injuries and to travel to Blacklight. He arrived at the Kamora Tong headquarters there just in time to discover House Halahu's dissolution. By the time he had fully recovered and was ready to work again, the Kamona Tong would disband. Each wise man was taking control of a separate branch. Unfortunately, his mentor and the wise man they both served were missing. Neither of them had been seen since the explosion of Vardenfell. His was not the only case in which this had happened. And the current reigning kingpin of the Kamona Tong, prior to its splitting up, decided to eliminate all loose ends. He did this in the most politically convenient way possible, by sending them on suicide missions. The Life Taker's mission was to infiltrate Skyrim by way of Solstheim, to pretend to be a Dunmer refugee, establish a cover life such as a new member of the Companions or a traveling adventurer, and then proceed to build up wealth and power by interfering in Skyrim Civil War. Returning to the newly reformed Tong ten years henceforth, with all the wealth he had acquired. He was promised the position of Hammer for this. He didn't know at the time that his destiny would be a little darker. This is a listing of the mods that will be used in this build. The first mods I list will be the required ones to get the same effect, and the second set will be the recommended mods to just get a little bit extra boost out of your experience. Now keep in mind, this video assumes that you have the common mod index, aka the common foundation. So click on that video if you don't have it. For any mods I don't list here that you may want to look at, check out the Ultimate Mod Codex. First mod, to put all those assassin powers into the game, you're going to want Sneak Tool. While Sneak Tools has been fully integrated into Percus Maximus, we want your character to have those abilities right from the start without having to invest a single perk. Keep in mind, if you do get the Thief's Toolbox perk later on, it's going to double up the crafting recipes It's going to look kind of awkward, so I recommend avoiding that perk when you install this mod. This mod is going to give your Dark Elf the Spirit Whispers ability. It revamps all the racials in the game, and keep in mind, if you're using Revenge of the Enemies, they're going to be able to use these enhanced racials as well. This revamps all the standing stones in the game, and this build specifically calls for the revamped Thief Stone. The revamped Thief Stone is going to allow you to do quadruple damage against an enemy that has 25% health or less, allowing you to finish it off. The overhaul for this build is once again going to be Percus Maximus. There are very important light weaponry, sneak, and dexterity perks you're going to want for this build. Now to start you off as a refugee on Raven Rock, we're going to be using Alternate Start Live Another Life. No starting spells is going to remove your Heal and Flame spell, your character will only start with the Lightning Spark spell. This is important because we want your character reliant on potions, you will not be using Restoration. In the character setup, you're going to see some fine details that need to be applied to your character. These will be done through Sky Tweak. Now because you're going to be such a badass at knocking people out and robbing them and whatnot, we're going to go ahead and tweak the economy. This is what Trade and Barter is for. Be sure to pick up the Imperius patch on the download page for Imperius on the Nexus. Don't forget to get patches for any other mods you happen to be using prior to creating your Skyproc patch for Percus Maximus. Here are the two main patch collections. Make sure to check if there are any available for the mods you're using. Because your character is going to be extremely reliant on alchemy for both potions and poisons, stamina and health, Harvest Overhaul is a must. What Harvest Overhaul does is it increases the amount of reagents you get per harvest. So picking a flower bush could give you, say, four flowers instead of just one. They've taken a balanced approach without going completely overboard in the number of items you get. This will make alchemy a much more friendly experience. By the same author as Aurora and Imperius, these two mods are highly recommended to supplement your experience. Winter Mist is going to overhaul the enchantments to the game, adding a lot more really fun ones. These new and unique items will be added to the leveled list so you'll find them naturally. Apocalypse is the biggest, most balanced spell package in all of Skyrim. 
As Illusion will be the only school of magic you will be able to use, it makes sense to add more Illusion spells to the game. Make sure to pick up the Percus Maximus compatibility patch on the download page for each of these mods. As you start on Solstheim, and Solstheim will eventually become your Morrowind home away from home, Raven Rock Expanded is going to do just what the title suggests. It's going to expand Raven Rock, add some new vendors, make it look more pretty. Solstheim was originally in the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind second expansion called Blood Moon, and it had a lot more dungeons than the Skyrim version has. Well, this mod brings them back. The ultimate upgrade for Raven Rock. It's just flat out going to look better. That said, if your Skyrim starts to lag or crashes while in Raven Rock, go ahead and remove this mod because it is processor intensive. The ultimate companion mod to any Morrowind based build. You're going to be finding and helping out the hero of Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind here in Skyrim. This mod revamps the entire Civil War, making it possible to actually lose the Civil War, but likewise turning it into a fluid experience that is not the same twice. In short, it stops the Civil War from being boring. Now, keep in mind that the scripts that cause the Civil War to work begin as soon as you create your character, so this mod needs to be installed prior to character creation. Any spells and powers that an NPC should be granted based on their race or their type of character will be granted to them, and their AI will know how to take advantage of it with Revenge of the Enemies. Orcs will Blood Rage, Hives will use Highborn, Vampires will turn into a swarm of bats. Approach, my child and choose where your new life shall begin. You will be a refugee from Morrowind, heading to Raven Rock. May you find a new and better life on Solstheim, my child. Alright, first step, hit the tilde key to open up the command console. Now we're going to make sure your character begins with the essential equipment. First, an Iron Dagger. The code for the Iron Dagger is 1397E and then space one in order to give you one iron dagger. Again, with the player dot add item, 3B562 is the item code, then one, to create one longbow. Congratulations, that's all the items from Vanilla Skyrim you're getting. Next, we're gonna have to identify the mod code for Dragonborn on your installation of Skyrim. How we do this is we type help, in quotes, M-I-R-A-A-K. That is the final boss of the Dragonborn expansion. As you can see in this case, the code is 07. So we're going to keep that in mind. Now whatever code yours comes up with, that's what you're going to use. Knowing that two-digit mod code, you're going to substitute all the XX's in the following lines for your mod code. Once you've finished adding these items in, you're going to have yourself a full set of chit and armor. Go ahead and equip the set now through your items menu. Now you're starting to look like a member of the Kimona Tong. However, you only have a dagger when you are going to be dual wielding. So let's get you your Katar right now. Open the command console again and type help and in parenthesis type iron Katar. Three items should come up. An Iron Katar, a Reforged Katar, and a Warforged Katar. You're going to notice that the mod code is different between the regular Iron Katar and the Warforged and Reforged ones. You don't want to mess with the Reforged or Warforged ones right now because those will be created automatically through blacksmithing later. So go ahead and add item the code for the Katar. making sure to put one at the end. This will create an iron katar for your character. Your character should look like this. The idea is the left mouse button will stab with your dagger to get massive criticals, and the right mouse button will try to stagger the enemy with the katar. As you kill bandits and other enemies, you will find other fist weapons such as claws or knuckles. Claws or katars are in theme for your character as well as daggers but anything else should not be used, except under special circumstances. For utility, you are given a bow. 
In situations where you need to use ranged combat, this will be what you use. Now that we've taken care of the item requirements, let's set up the character further. Hit Escape, go to Mod Configuration, and under Mod Configuration, go to Sky Tweak. Immediately, go to Experience. Under Experience, go ahead and set Alteration to 0.2. You'll be doing this with other magic skills as well to show your character's ineptitude in magic. They will only learn magic at a 20% rate. Alteration, Conjuration, Destruction, and Restoration should all be 0.2. Keep Illusion at 1.0 as it will be the only field of magic that you have any talent in, as well as Enchanting because it's kind of a generic skill that your character will require. As for Sneak, increase that to 1.3, giving yourself a 30% learning boost in Sneak. Go ahead and do this with both Pickpocket and Lockpicking as well. So what we've created is a character that is very good at thievery, is very bad at magic, and is neutral in pretty much everything else. This is going to reflect in how quickly you learn things. Next, you're going to want to increase carry weight per level to 15 from 5. And the reason is, is because you're a thief, you're going to be carrying a lot of items. It's assumed that your armor is filled with pockets and places to hide things, but the idea is you don't have to be as picky as to what you pick up to steal. Once these tweaks are done, go to the Trade and Barter Mod Configuration menu. Go ahead and click on Barter Rates and start the mod. Once the mod is activated, go ahead and go to Buying Prices and set it up by 30%. This will make all items that you wish to buy 30% more expensive. Next, take the selling prices and reduce them by 30%. So now, when you sell items, they are 30% less valuable and when you're buying items, they cost 30% more. This is to compensate for the fact that you can carry more, and you're basically going to become a god of stealing things. Now go over to Price Variables, and you're going to see a 20% penalty in your fence rate. Go ahead and bring that up to zero. Now stolen goods are worth just as much as regular goods. Go ahead and leave all the other fields alone. Finally, on Merchant, set it to Medium Variability, so that merchants can have variable gold. Leave everything else alone. Now, save your game. Your character is now equipped in full chitin armor, has a katar and a dagger, and is able to instantly kill enemies from behind. When we look at your magic menu, we can see that you have the whispers already. At this point, your character is ready to face Skyrim. I recommend picking up everything in Raven Rock you can, however, I do not recommend leaving the settlement as all the creatures in Solstheim start off at level 20. When you are ready to leave Solstheim, go ahead and hit the map and click on the Skyrim button to fast travel there. You cannot use the ship at this point in the game. As soon as you fast travel to Skyrim, it's going to take you to Windhelm. You're free to go wherever you want at this point, however, to make the build most effective, you should head over to Whiterun, take the run to Riverwood, and get to the Guardian Stones. As I've mentioned, the Thief Stone is going to give you quadruple damage against targets below 25% health. Compared to other builds, your damage is going to be fairly low when you're not instantly assassinating the target. But with the Thief Stone, after whittling their health down, you'll be able to finish them off quickly. As a Life Taker, you're pretty much going to want to avoid one-on-one -on -one combat whenever possible, relying instead on your spirits to protect you. That said, one-on-one -on -one combat will become a bit easier once you get counter, which will allow you to basically become invulnerable while attacking. So as long as you keep an onslaught of attacks going, you should take very little damage. Now if you think you're going to invest in Katars, go ahead and take the Piercing Thrust Path. However, if you think you're going to invest in Claws instead, use Clear Cut. All paths lead to Dervish, where you're going to be able to knock down enemies in mid-combat. And since you're going to be using daggers anyway, I highly recommend picking up Blood Price. With Blood Price, not only will your piercing attacks cause bleeding damage, but then subsequent attacks will deal more damage while they are bleeding. The ranged weapons tree is not vital until you start fighting dragons. The light armor tree, now because counter doesn't protect you against lightning bolts, this is what distinct dispersion is for. The sneak tree is a pretty straightforward path. While the Prodigy for this may be tempting, you should forego it in favor of a Prodigy in a different tree. 
Ultimately, the talent you're working toward is Shadowbound, where once every five minutes, you'll be able to go into invisibility for two minutes. As for dexterity, pretty much the entire tree is vital. In my case, I went ahead and got the Pilferer as my prodigy for this character. You can only have one prodigy per character. And I got it for greed. Infest is going to let you reverse pickpocket poisons on people. Inventor is going to allow you to craft several things, but I only picked it up in order to get utility belt. Causes gadgets, traps, lockpicks, potions, and poisons not to weigh anything. After that, I picked up Snatch, which is a prerequisite for Monkey Grip. And the idea is, is that Monkey Grip will allow my Katar or my Claw to steal an enemy shield in combat while the enemy is blocking. The final perk allowing you to steal their armor as well. From the Alchemy Tree, you're going to find that Distillation is going to give you much better poisons that will last for more than one attack. Illusion, if you plan to use the tree at all, you should put one perk into Novice. It is the only perk that will actually reduce the Magicka cost. If you do end up going deep into Illusion, you'll be able to choose one of two Focus perks. Similar to how Prodigy works, only one per character, only one Focus can be applied per character. You will have the choice between basically summoning an army of phantoms to fight for you, or having superior command of Calm, Fear, and Fury spells. I highly recommend the Puppet Master between the two because having an army to fight for you is simply better, especially when you're trying to get behind the enemies to assassinate them and not get damaged yourself. As no other mastery really suits this character, if you're going to pick a mastery, I recommend the Smithing Mastery Warforged, where you're basically going to be able to craft Warforged versions of your existing gear. Keep in mind that if you work toward this, you will not be able to enchant that gear because that gear is already superior. On the other hand, if you choose a different mastery, you should go ahead and work up the enchanting as well. That said, once you've got Counter, Blood Price, and Dervish, your attacks are basically complete. And it's all about gear from then on. Hit Escape, go to Mod Configuration, and under Mod Configuration, go to Sky Tweak. Go ahead and increase the damage you deal on Legendary Difficulty from 0.25 to 0 0.50 bringing it on par with Master Difficulty Damage dealt. But for Damage Taken Legendary, go ahead and increase that to 5.0. This is going to make the game very brutal and unforgiving as far as sitting in enemies' faces beating on them. You're going to want to run away when it's appropriate. You're going to want to take advantage of every sneaky, dirty trick you can. Out of my different builds, this build felt the weakest. That is to say, I really couldn't take a hit worth a damn, and I always had to go to my menu and use a potion to recover. However, that created a certain level of excitement that other builds simply didn't have, because I always had an out, as it were. With this build, I pretty much relied on my spirits, and just kept getting behind enemies, assassinating them one by one by one. It was truly satisfying whenever I came across an NPC that I didn't feel like, oh well if I kill him now I'm going to be missing out on something later. I could always knock him out and rob him, and that way he'd still be alive when I came back later. With my Knights of the Nine build, I would always tell the skooma dealers on the road, that's illegal, illegal you know. know, and they would immediately attack me, and I had to rely on that to kill them because they weren't hostile. Well with this build, I could buy all the skooma I wanted, and then I could assassinate the guy to get my money back. So it was fun to reverse the role, you know. I played a moral paragon first, and then I played a guy without any morals whatsoever. And due to the nature of his character and his morals, I found it difficult to find a tangible goal for him. But that said, the whisper mechanic just made it too good to pass up, being the listener of the Dark Brotherhood. I mean, you can easily assume at that point that he's basically given up the tong, and he has his own goals in life from that point on. Also another interesting thing to ponder is his role in dragon slaying. I mean he could use the blades as his personal minions and as a result uh, he would definitely kill Parthenax just to get their support again. I mean how illogical and bad was that choice? It, 
Oh, you are the ultimate dragon slayer. It is our goal to assist you. And from now on, you know, instead of protecting Tiber Septim, we're going to protect you. Oh, by the way, if you don't kill Parthenax, then we're not going to help you anymore after all. I mean, just how bad is that writing, really? Esburn or whatever his name is? He is a load smarter than that. He would see reason. Which is why on every other character I install the Parthenax Dilemma mod. This character, being a life taker of the Kimona Tong, listener of the Dark Brotherhood, and just a worshipper of the House of Troubles, there is no way he wouldn't kill Parthenax. And that's kind of refreshing in one way, that I've found a character that would actually sell out uh, his mentor, so to speak. Because Parthenax, for this character, was just uh, a tool to be used. <laughs> now, I obviously won't always do a history that's nearly this long, but the problem with uh, this Morrowind character is that to understand the political aspect, you have to understand the gods. To understand the gods, you have to understand all of Elder Scrolls III Morrowind. So, with this, this, and that, I just went and I just basically dumped it all into the game. And, you know, I may reference this video with other videos because I just don't see myself doing an elaborate history, not nearly as much. And I have to watch out for these guys. There we go. I knocked him down. Ah, oh, Maroon's, uh, Maroon's razor killed him. Okay. And if it turns out you like the build or hell just like the video, uh, like, comment, subscribe. But really, I don't care about likes and subscribes very much. Just comment because that's where I get my feedback. That's where, you know, I figure out what I want to do next. I mean, obviously, by the time people get around to commenting, I've already got my next project lined up. But, uh, what do I do after that project? You know what I mean? Like, two steps ahead, where the comments come in. Alright, so I'm back in Solstheim for the first time since creating the character. Let's go ahead and get our ass kicked on Legendary Difficulty with Revenge of the Enemies. <laughs> areas like Bleak Falls Barrow are a joke right now. That said, areas like Solstheim are still very, very scary. And the difference is, they're the types of enemies. When it comes right down to it, Dervish will let me knock these guys down. But the amount of damage I'm able to deal to them is limited. Until I get them to low health, of course. Potions, always potions. I don't know why I just wasted a health potion, but yeah. So my Katar is what uh, staggers him. You see the way he backs up like that? That's the Katar in action. Now, uh, what I need for him is to get in combat with my spirit. I'll cut you in two, fetch. <laughs> See that? That's Dervish. <laughs> anyway, we'll be able to down them eventually. There we go. You see, as soon as he gets below 25% uh, health, his health drops so quickly. There we go. Bam. All of the testing for my builds is live streamed at twitch.tv forward slash Zahakaron. As for news as to what I'm doing, when I'm going to be streaming, things of that nature, you can find that at my Twitter feed. The debate as to the next build that will be displayed here is between a Cryomancer, a Synod Artificer, and a Whispering Fang Monk.